Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is Rapscast, episode five, yet to be named. I'm here in the studio. I'm with my good buddy, Kyle. Kyle, how you doing? What up, Jacoby? Doing all right, man. Doing all right. We're speaking to the people out there. Yeah, it's been a good week. It has been. Yeah, not, not so good for our team, though. Well, better than it was a week ago when we were in here, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had a good week, then a bad one. Yeah, exactly. And now we're sort of surfing the mediocrity. Yeah. All right, well, let's, we're going to dive right into Around the League. Uh, segment number one, what's our first Around the League topic, Kyle? First time in, a, in league history, had, uh, more than one person's been named Player of the Month in the Eastern Conference, for any conference, actually. So the complete starting five in Atlanta are the Players of the Month for the Eastern Conference. So that's Jeff Teague, Kyle Korver, Damari Carroll, Al Horford, and Paul Millsap all being named the Eastern Conference Players of the Week. Uh, of course, I think Atlanta only with eight losses so far in the whole season. They're basically the best team in the league. I n- I'm shocked. I never would have seen that coming from the beginning of the year. Uh, do you think they got it right? you think it's a, a good reason to make history? Well, the reason they did that is they're the first team to have like a perfect month, right? They went 17-0. and uh, I think they're the first team either to have a perfect month or the, a perfect month of January. Unbe- and they're playing such a great style of basketball. I was kind of shocked when they did it at first because, I don't know, it kind of takes away like the prestigiousness of the, of the right. prize, right? Just because I feel like down the road, once you do this, now you're going to start doing it more often, you know? Like, I don't know. But, but looking at it, they did all deserve it. 17-0. and 0, they all had a big hand. If you go look up their stats, every single player will blow you away with one stat, okay? Mm-hmm. Paul Millsap, high points, high rebounds, shoots over 40% from three. Teague, high, reba- uh, high rebounds for a point guard, high assists, high points, shoots at a crazy high clip. Corver's a machine. I don't even need to tell you. I've, told, I've said it so much how well he shoots. And even Al Horford's hitting like 38% from the three. Everyone's doing their role. And they do all have impressive numbers if you look at, you know, a number that's not just points per game. Really goes to show you the effect of good coaching because I don't think their roster actually changed that much from last year to this. But they're just getting used to playing together and I guess the coach really has them doing what they need to do. Yeah, well, last year at the end of the year they were playing this style and they really impressed me last year too. They they had a good postseason run and they, they improved this year really just out of improving their chemistry. I think that was the biggest the biggest improvement in them. You think any expert preseason uh, predicted that <laughs> the winners of the Eastern Conference, or well, we I won't say it's a runaway, but uh, the leaders of the East at this point in the season would be the Atlanta Hawks. Well, I, I you know I wish I could say that I did. I could say I was pretty high on them, but I you didn't think they'd be better than think, all these teams. I did though. not think they'd be this good. They are they are fantastic. Congratulations to the Atlanta for the for the perfect month and for the. Uh, you know, all five players of the month. That's a pretty pretty prestigious thing. I've ne- Of course, it's never happened before. Mm-hmm. So Atlanta making history two ways at once. Yeah. Well done in that franchise. Let's talk about Dwight. Yeah, man, Dwight. Dwight, he's hurt. You think he's going to be out for about a month and a half or so. Um, I, I don't. I really don't like what this does to the, uh, the poor Houston Rockets. James Harden's going to have to carry this team on his back uh, and hop on one foot the rest of the way. I mean, he's really going to have to carry them and, and, and give his everything. And uh, come playoff time, I think that could have serious repercussions on his fatigue or on his mentality. Uh, it's, it's a lot to ask for a player like him. I know he's a, an MVP candidate and a fantastic player, but uh, him carrying that team without a, a player like Dwight, I mean, you lose a lot when you lose a player like Dwight, and I think they're in real trouble. Kyle? Yeah, well, it's tough. They missed the, the beginning of the season with him too, and they did well, right? So hopefully they can continue that. He's a great player. He is supposed to come back uh at the start of the playoffs. We just read this today. His doctor, who's going to do his surgery, said that's how it is. We're going to miss him on the defensive end, offensive end. We don't need to talk. We could talk a while about how good of a player he is and how much he he's really a superstar and one of the leaders of the team. So they're going to miss him. That's without a doubt. That being said, the Rockets, they play they play well this year. And, they, you know, they, they did all right without him at the beginning of the season. I think they'll tough it out now. That might, at the worst end, like the worst thing, I could, not the worst thing, but a funny thing that we could see happen as a result of this is now Josh Smith could get more minutes and more shots, and that might, you know... Revive might... his career in, in out in Houston. Oh, I was going to say on the downside that more shots to Josh Smith equals more losses. Oh, you think so? Yeah. So you think Josh Smith is just sucky now? No, I think he does things well. I think he's like, 
like same type of player, like body and skill set ish as James Johnson. He just doesn't want to accept that. He wants to think that he's Dwight Howard, I see. but he's not. He never will be. Yeah, I, I just think the Houston Rockets are going to have a lot of trouble. I mean, we're now later in the season. It's not like it was at the beginning of the season. The teams, for the most part, at least the good ones, have sort of found their identity. They know what they're going to be this year, how they play, how they beat teams. And Houston, I think, losing their like a huge piece like that on both ends of the floor, even if he's not just scoring the basketball, just like him setting screens and being a threat on the inside really helps their basketball team find success. And I think with him out, it all falls squarely on, uh, on James Harden, who... Uh, who might feel the effects of that come playoff time trying to get a run going. Well, the upside is James Johnson is instant offense. I mean, the guy, we know the Raptors, we know how they get fouled quite often. He's the Picasso of getting fouled. I mean, he goes to the he goes to the line like 10 times a game. It's ridiculous. I think that his coach even coach McHale said that Harden's Harden's ability to get fouled is a form of art. That was <laughs> that was his quote this week. So, he he will carry the offense. What we're going to probably see is that the defense is going to suffer. Now, Josh Smith is a great defensive player. I put him down, but he is a great defensive player. The only thing is they don't have Omer Ashik anymore, and they don't have that big five that they really built their team. They built their team around having a big, real mm-hmm. center yeah. defending the paint, and they don't have another one. So we'll see what happens. I, I Hopefully, hopefully it all goes well. I like James Harden. He's a great player. Yeah, no, me too. I love him. But uh, I, I think he'll, he has his work cut out for him. Yeah. All right, let's move on. So the all-star teams, uh, starters and uh, reserves, have been announced and finalized. And um, we think some people maybe didn't make it who should have. Uh, a couple notable snubs uh, in both conferences. Kyle, why don't you tell us who you think should have made it? Well, I think the Eastern Conference, really everything was everything sounded good to me, right? Uh yeah, for the most part, yeah. For the most part, it, you know, I like the starters. Maybe none of, none of the names jump out at me and say like I don't, I really don't deserve to be here. Maybe Carmelo Anthony on the league worst or among the league worst Knicks, but that's about yeah, it. Yeah, but and and there's nobody who's not an all star that I'm like, oh my god, I can't believe they're not there. In the East, you mean? In the East, in the East, the West. That's is a, a different, different story. It's a different story, but you know that also comes with the West. There are more good players in the West. Everybody knows this. Everybody wants to be in the West. Good teams too good teams and there's only a certain amount there's only 12 spots on the all-star team so we're i think we're each going to just say who we who we wanted to be in the all-star oh no we're going to say biggest snubs right yeah well we yeah well, okay so let's talk about damien lillard yes he was definitely number one snub I he mean. was pissed about being snubbed too he said he felt like he was disrespected by the league yeah like he, he wasn't getting his should due be. you know he's a guy who's on the nba ladder the mvp ladder for the end of the season you re- really you think so no he is right now oh, on the oh, nba.com okay. mvp ladder he's been talked about at, as a potential mvp candidate all year and to not even make the all-star team that's that's a slap in the face yeah that is the equivalent of the kyle lowry one last year right okay? he, i mean he's a he's a great player on a great team he's in fact he's the best player on a great team yeah he is he is one of the leaders on one of the best teams. And he is, we've talked about how good a, good a player is. He wins games. He has the three. He has the drive. He plays defense. And he makes clutch shots. It's, it's crazy. But here's the good side, okay? Damian Lillard, in his entire career, has been a player, much like DeMar DeRozan in a sense, and that's why I like him. They're very mentally tough, and they both love to have a chip on their shoulder, something to prove, and something to say, Something to show people wrong, mm-hmm. right? So this is the type of thing that down the road will be good for him because it's giving him something to play for. Good motivation for him. Yeah, it's great motivation. Guys like this, guys like Damar and Damian, they love this. Mm-hmm. You know, it's better for them in the long run than making the All-Star team. Demar DeRozan. They thrive on the haters, Kyle. They thrive on the haters. Demar DeRozan, look, he didn't get named. He, we're going to talk about later. He's having a great week. He's coming back great. Yeah. Damian Lillard is going to play off his mind like – for the rest of the season. Just trying to show everybody how big of a mistake they really made, eh? Yeah. I can't believe they took Chris Paul over Damian Lillard. Can't, no, 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 no. I, I see you smiling. <laughs> I just I love Chris really... Paul. I guess I'm just like a fanboy. Your you're Kyle Korver is my Chris Paul. Not yeah. exactly, well, but... Well, not exactly. I know Kyle Korver is not Chris Paul. Right, right. But this, Chris Paul this season has not, you know, if you took away the name, the allure of Chris Paul by yeah. name, yeah. and just put them in a vacuum... Damian Lillard is the better player on the better team this year. How in the world is he not an all-star? It's the same argument that I made about Rondo a couple episodes ago. Yeah. Damian Lillard in a vacuum is a better player than Chris Paul. But if you surround Chris Paul with Hall of Famers, he'll make them better than Damian Lillard will. 
Like Chris Paul can be a great point guard on a fantastic team. He can but make them unstoppable. But he's not. Because he doesn't he's have. A, he's on a fantastic team. He's got a great team on paper with a great coach. Not that much depth. Less. I mean, he's got a couple he's, big guys, but he, I don't... he's done less. And what? And do, what about the Portland Trailblazers? Are stacked. They're not as stacked. They're about equally stacked. Portland doesn't have as great of a bench as you think. Chris Kamen, Steve Blake. Steve Blake, yeah. Yeah, I mean, who's there? Do they have any like wings off the bench in Portland? Who's there? Like, uh, who's their instant offense man? If they have one, they're all right. <laughs> okay, okay, you're right. Yeah, that's yeah. not a very good bench. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, actually, the Clippers are really deep. What? You're yeah, right. They're really deep. Great coach. Now, so are the uh, so are the Trailblazers, right? It's just in a vacuum, like. I think a lot of it is that we have the name of Chris Paul. I mean, the guy has his own shoe at Jordan. If we took it away, if we <laughs> if we just gave him a different name for a few days without all the hype, all the hype beastness. Yeah, the hype. <laughs> exactly. Hype beastity. Then we'd have Damian Lillard in the All Star game. All right. But you know what? Fuck it. This is going to be better for him in the long run. Let's talk about one more. Monte Ellis. <laughs> yeah, the man in Dallas. He I'm, reviving Dallas. The yeah. Dallas Mavericks return to relevancy, if you will. Yep. I mean, it's not like they took a long hiatus from relevancy, but they got back to it when uh, when Monte went, came to town. Yeah, I think this one, I mean, I clearly think that Damian is the all-star snub, so he deserves it more, but, but Monte deserves to be in the game, and it's really, it comes down to a factor of there's only so many players you could put in the game, right? There's 12, it's a deep conference, what can you do? There's nobody that jumps off the paper on the reserve that say, oh, he shouldn't be there, I mean... I just gave Chris Paul some hate compared to Damian, but, you know, he still deserves to be an all-star. But if you want to go with that whole vacuum argument, right now at this moment, uh, Kobe Bryant did a vacuum with him. Oh, that's true. I forgot about Kobe. You know, Kobe got voted in as a starter, right? You're right. So that's, it's harder to say that, uh, You're right. that the coaches got it wrong or whatever. It's a popularity yeah. thing for him. That's but exactly in it. a vacuum, similar to like what we just did on the other side, uh, Kobe is not as good of a player right now as Monte Ellis. Fully agree. So. Fully agree. But... It's a little different because, as we said, he's a starter. Right. So what I was trying to do is look at the reserves because, you know, really the all-star vote is just a popularity contest. I yeah. Mean, you know, shout out to Prime Minister Harper getting <laughs> Lowry yeah. in the game. But it's really a popularity contest. Everybody knows it's a wash, so I can't really judge on that end because, you know what, I'd love to see Kobe Bryant in the all-star game too. I'm a fanboy. Uh, well, good, good. Yeah. Fanboys are good. But on the reserves, he deserves to be there. I'm a little angry he's not. I mean, he's a great player. He's doing great things. And it's really, it's amazing to see how he's revitalized his career in Dallas, right? He got there from Milwaukee. We weren't sure, you know, he's he's kind of a system guy. And it just, as soon as he got into Coach Carlisle's system, amazing. Jump in points, jump in assists, jumps in efficiency. And it's really, Dallas has become, I mean, we all know it's Dirk's team, but really, when you look at the the actual statistics, we know now that it's Monte Ellis' team. It's he's the go-to clutch the basket go-to shooter. Guy. Yeah, absolutely. That's absolutely. exactly it. Yeah. And Dirk Dirk will acknowledge this, right? Yeah. Dirk wants to win, and he's the biggest team player in 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 the league right now, taking like nine million dollars this year. But mm-hmm. that's a story for another time. But he's done great things, Monte Ellis in Dallas. I wish I saw him in the All Star game. I wish they could have at least given him. Some kind of credit, maybe put him in the all star in the uh, the point guard skill challenge, something like that. It, it's really a shame that he's not there. Mm. Let's go around to the next one. Let's talk about Jacques Vaughn getting fired. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Jacques Vaughn, head coach of the Magic, we were reading all week that he's probably not going to make it through the week, and yeah, that was true. He got fired in his third year coaching. He was a first time head coach. He before he was uh, an assistant for the Spurs. Didn't do great things. What do you think, Jacoby? Well, the Orlando Magic are 15 and 37 as of right now. Uh, they're still a young team. They still have a lot of draft picks. They're still trying to find their potential. Um, they did lose 10 of their last 10. They're, they're on a long losing streak here. I'm not sure how I feel about firing a coach. How long has he been there? Do you know? Three years. Three. Okay, so at least they gave him his due. Like, they gave him his, uh, like, a real chance. You know what I mean? But, uh... Like, what, what do they expect him to get out of that squad? I don't think that on paper they're really all that deep or all that good anyway yet. I mean, they got a lot, a lot of young kids still waiting to develop and become, you know, the real NBA players that they hope to be. Um, if they can get, uh, you know, George Carl, like we're going to discuss later, some of these big-name guys, then, yeah, the move looks good. But um, firing coaches to me in any sport creates a lot, like a, a big panic amongst the team. The guys all have to get used to a whole new thing now. They break their routine. 
Uh, it's a lot of new stuff to get used to. I think they're basically throwing this season in the trash and just trying to uh, try to gear up for next and the and the the you know the distant future or the not so distant future. Yeah. So there's a lot of things I didn't say. We could have a long conversation of this, but I'll just try to boil it down. The problem with Vaughn is that it wasn't that they were winning a ton. I mean, their expectations this year were trying to get that eighth seed. So that's around. 42 wins. Unrealistic expectations. I don't though. think so. They had the right amount of veterans. They have really promising young guys. The problem was that Vaughn wasn't developing a winning culture, and a lot of that boils down to the to the head office, right? They would have Vaughn do a lot of things to try to lose games and get high picks. So the problem is when you have when you when you as a player have a coach that in the back of your mind you get a feeling that he's not out for your best interest. They didn't listen to him anymore. You know, you, you'd see in the Magic that they were starting to call their own plays, call their own timeouts. They weren't really respecting uh, Coach Vaughn anymore. So a guy like that needs to go. And the Magic, their head office, regardless of what we think, whether it's realistic or not, they wanted to hunt for that eighth seed this I year. Did, I, I, that should never have been in the cards for them, in my they opinion. They got a few veterans. They got Luke Ridenour. They got Channing Fry. <laughs> Those aren't people who bring you to the playoffs, though. Channing Fry, well, eighth seed in the East. Right, right, in that's the true. East, that's it's true. not that hard. I mean, they're they're about seven games back from from getting that eighth seed. But they guys like it. Oladipo and Aaron Gordon and Vucevic and, and uh, Alfred Payton, even Evan Fournier, Tobias Harris, like all these young, Tobias, their best players are all really young and they still are not really as good young. as they're going to get. Yes, exactly. And so not only were that, but they weren't getting that winning culture. They had a losing culture. The prospects weren't developing as they wanted. And, you know, it was time for Vaughn to go. Mm-hmm. There was a lack of respect between the players and the coach. A la- there was a lack of trust between the coach and the head office. Okay, get rid of the guy. I agree. I like the magic a lot, and it's time they bring in someone who could really give the team a sense that hey, we we are here to win. They've drafted so well. So uh, well. Just looking at these names, like if they can get this to come together, they could be a special team in the East. Kylo for sure. Quinn in the second round. Yeah, I love the Kyles. That's you it. Lo- <laughs> love the Kyles. Kyle Quinn, Kyle Korver. Kyle like Lowry. all these guys, there's no way they took everybody here in the first round. Like where did Evan Fournier go? Evan Fournier, he, he did go in the first round. He did eh? go in the first round. So got him from Oflalo. They've just they've drafted or, or managed their. their you know assets what it is? So Hennigan well. is so great at getting the really undervalued, buried deep in the bench guys that nobody sees coming. Mm-hmm. Remember when they traded JJ Redick, who was having a great year for Tobias Harris? What Everybody was going, "Who the yeah. fuck?" I'm myself too. Who the fuck was Tobias Harris? He looks like J Cole, by the way. Does Tobias Harris? Yeah. <laughs> and he's unbelievable. He is unbelievable. Tobias Harris. He's so athletic. Yeah, athletic, has like a great uh, build for an NBA player. They better lock him up this offseason. He's going to be a restricted free agent. If they, they got to get him. If they can lock up their young guys, watch yeah. out for the Magic. They have a promising young core, yeah, right? Yeah, They're not ready to make a playoff run, but they're ready to try to compete for that eighth seed. And the problem is they were shamefully losing. As you said, they lost 10 of the 10 last games. They've lost 16 of their last 18 games. <laughs> there you go. So they're on a 10-game losing streak. 16 of the 18 games lost. Mm-hmm. That's just terrible culture. you got to get rid of him. But let's talk about who they're trying to bring in. So what they want to do is try to bring in a little more of an established head coach, someone with a proven track record, someone who's going to get the respect of the staff. Now, the problem with this traditionally is that most coaches don't want to come in midseason because it takes a lot of time to develop that culture, try to get your system going, and a lot of head coaches want to hire their own assistant coaches. Mm-hmm. The only thing that's going right for the Magic right now is they're seen a, among the coaches as a really like a good situation, and head coaches that normally wouldn't want to come midseason are willing to come to the Magic because, because it's a hot job, like we just discussed. Yeah, it's a hot yeah. job. They have prom- They have a promising team on on uh, paper. It looks good to better. a coach wanting to build, wanting to make something really special. You yeah, know? and it, you know what? If you get on this season and you you recognize, okay, this season we're they might try to get to the playoffs, but this season is about learning. I want to establish my my system now, and then in training camp, we're going to get that concrete, and then next year, we're going to be great. That could happen. Mm-hmm. So it is a good coaching position, one that wants to be had. So there are a few names in in the uh, pool. One's Mike Malone, just got fired from Sacramento. One is Scott Skiles from Milwaukee. The record holder for the most assists in one NBA game. Yeah. With 30. Yes, and one is Mark Jackson, ex-coach of Golden State. And the last one, who they haven't really talked about, but he said he's interested, George Carl. What do you think about these guys? To me, it's a no-brainer who they should look into, and that's George Carl. If you're talking about they wanted an established coach, somebody who's got a, a track record that uh, 
you know, that precedes them. George Carl's like revered as one of the better coaches in the NBA. He knows how to make a team run. Uh, really has an amazing system, and I think like building with young kids as a teacher is really like what he does. I look at his work in Denver. Um, like he, I think he'd be great in Orlando. Frankly, I think they could really turn that around quick and reach the potential that we just discussed. You know, being a contender in the East with the help of George Carl. Frankly, the other guys on here, I don't, I can't talk so much about. But Mark Jackson, I will say this: Steve Kerr has made Mark Jackson look like less of a coach this year. Yes. Steve Kerr has made it look like Mark Jackson can't really get the best out of the teams that he coaches. Yeah. Because they didn't change their roster all that much, and boy, have they come together and look like a whole different team this year. Like, they're they're the best in the West, right? So, which is a huge accomplishment. Um, so Mark Jackson's stock, in my opinion, has lowered, and he's not that established coach like we, like we spoke about. He's only been in the coaching game for really a minute, relatively. Um, if I'm them, I snatch George Carl. I give him $10 billion if he wants it. Get George Carl on board, and you can make something special. No, I agree, but let's talk about let's talk about a few of the others. Scott Skiles, quickly, I don't think he's a good choice. He's very established. He's been coaching for a while, but you know his last job in the Milwaukee Bucks really never got them anywhere. He's a decent teacher, but he's one of those guys that you keep him for two years and then you chuck him. You know, he's not he's not a long term solution. So, fuck him. My, Mike Malone, he did well in Sacramento. Really small sample size, though. He only coached maybe a season and a bit. Mm-hmm. So I'm not. Like, he's not someone I want to grab. We talked about established coaches. Mark Jackson. I mean, yes, Steve Kerr is making him look like a joke. And yeah, Steve Kerr is getting a lot more to the same. And Mark Jackson has like a history of not getting along with the front office and being difficult with his staff. So that's bad. But Mark Jackson is, I think he's a good pick. He's not the best pick, but he's a good pickup because he is a great defensive coach, mm-hmm. and that's a great that's a great mindset to instill. He's a not a great offensive coach, especially with a young team. You need to play yeah. defense first. Yeah, defense first, and he's very good at 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 teaching and getting the best out of young players like Clay Thompson. A lot of these guys they did well, and the players when he, Mark Jackson left, Stephen Steph Curry, uh, Clay Thompson, David Lee, they all stuck their neck out and said, "Don't fire him. We love him." He is well, a player's coach. Yeah, but I, th- I feel like they would reevaluate those feelings come yes. now. Okay, now, yes. But remember, he, he did get a lot out of Golden State. Steve Kerr's getting a lot more, but we could also add to the fact that Steve Kerr has a bit of an advantage too because most of those players have played together for longer. They have more chemistry. That's true. That is a good point. Right? Yeah. So it's not entirely the same. Now, Steve Kerr, don't get me wrong, I think he's a better coach. But Mark Jackson, I think, is a good coach too. He, he could still get a career going in the NBA, you think? Yeah, I think he. I think he'll get another shot, and I think he is a good coach. The Over, only, the would only you, thing, yeah. Uh, you go ahead, Kyle. The only thing that scares me is his rapport of having a bad relationship between front offices and amongst his uh, assistant coaches. That's what they say about us media men. We're hard to yeah. hard to get along with. But George Carl, as you were saying, he is the most established of all of them. So you wouldn't take Mark over George. Mark Jackson over George Carl. I would take George Carl in a heartbeat. Of course. I mean, his track record, he's won about 1,100 and something games and lost about 700 and something games. The best teacher of all these four men. Yeah. Unbelievable teacher for young young players. Really gets them to play a system. They can play it well and gets the best of these young guys. His systems aren't very complicated. And he's an established winner in the sense that he joined the Nuggets midseason. Right. And he was, most coaches, when they take over midseason, they do poorly that season. He was able to take the Nuggets that season and go 32 and 8. Mm-hmm. So he, he's good off the bat. He'll get the best out of, out of his young guys. And he's really established. He wins games. I mean, he got uh, a 51 or a 57 win season two years ago when he was coach of the year for Denver coaching on a team that doesn't look that much different on paper from this young Magic team, Mm -hmm. right? I think this young Magic team actually has more potential. They have a lot of... Nikola Vucevic is a player you can build around. Yeah, absolutely. Tobias Harris is a great player too. Channing Frye... Victor Oladipo is Victor Oladipo is amazing. And Channing Frye is like the Patrick Patterson of their team, right? Yeah, stretch four. You get... Those people are important. They have a good team on paper. I think it's also very contingent on the development of Alfred Payton. Yes, Yes, because right now he cannot shoot the ball for shit. Yeah, exactly. So, George Carl, you you do everything you can to get that guy. Yeah. <coughs> so, let's just jump to quick predicts. Want to do that? Go. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, so the first one is Dwayne Wade is out of the All-Star game. He injured his hamstring. So, they need to name a reserve replacement for him. So, we're just going to do quick predicts. Who do we think it's going to be? 
quick Derek who it Rose. Is. Derek Rose nope. in a vacuum. Uh, one of the best guards of left out. Still a, a nightmare to guard. Derek Rose is my call. Okay, mine's a little different. I'm doing Kyle Korver. You're laughing at me at that one, <laughs> but I'll tell you why. Okay, if I am, if I'm, because his name's Kyle. His name's Kyle. Yeah. That's, no, no, no. The real reason is if I'm making the choice, I want to win the All Star game. Okay. <laughs> there is enough people on that team who could drive, shoot. Uh, do all that. Kyle Korver could defend, but more importantly, he is going to stand at the three-point line, hit every single shot he gets, and he's going to be such a good fit on the team. They will win the team because he's there. Don't get me wrong. Derrick Rose is a better player. Kyle, people don't play defense in the All-Star game. It doesn't matter and how good why, you are. You just don't do it. There you go. And then, okay, would you rather have three points every possession or two points every possession? Three points every possession. But That's I, why I want Kyle Korver. Kyle Korver is a great three-point shooter, but like so is like almost everybody here. Like I think Carmelo Anthony would beat Kyle Korver in a three-point shootout. Not a chance. You don't think so? He's shooting 56% from the three this Yeah, because he's not getting double-teamed every possession. Yeah. And Carmelo is. I think I, Car- I think in a wide open like three point shootout. Of course, we'll never know the answer to this. We'll never I think answer. Carmelo would beat. Uh... You know what? Kyle Korver is in the three point shootout this year. Oh, true, eh? Yeah. And who else is there? Uh, Steph Curry, Clay and Thompson. Clay Thompson. Yeah, him and Kyrie Irving. Quick predict on that one. Kyle Korver, Kyle Korver for the win. I think Clay Thompson's gonna win. I think he's gonna have like be like near perfect. That like, he's a, just a machine. yeah, he's unbelievable. Yeah, definitely not Kyrie. Even though last time Kyrie was in it, he posted like a crazy high score. He can. They all these guys can just so shoot yeah. so well. You, yeah. you just never know what's gonna happen. Anyway, let's go to the schedule. We digress. Let's talk about the week. So our next game, mm-hmm. excluding the Clippers game because we're recording tonight, is the, we're playing the Spurs Sunday at home. Then the Wizards Wednesday at home, and then we're going to play the Atlanta Hawks, one of my all- other favorite teams, on an away game on Friday. Yeah. So, quick predicts on win loss. Why? Go ahead. It's going to be rough. Uh, we're going to do one game at a time here, or we're going to run through that all, all the ones we just mentioned. Do the whole thing, man. Okay. Loss, loss, loss. It may, the only win maybe against you, you know what I'll make it look brighter for our fans out there. We drop one to the Spurs. We beat the Wizards, and then the Hawks whip our asses in Atlanta. Wow, okay, that that pretty much matches mine. I think, okay, let's just start with the Wizards. The Wizards are not playing very well recently. I think we're going to beat the Wizards. Not a problem. Uh, the Spurs are tough. You know, they're such a wild card. They're you know? such a wild card. I'm going to say a loss. I'm going to agree with you. A loss against the Spurs, a win against the Wizards, and a loss against the Hawks because you can't beat the Hawks. Right? <laughs> it's like you're playing the Spurs the Wizards, and then the new Spurs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't think the Hawks will be as good in the playoffs as they are during the regular season, though, but we'll save that. We'll see. For... They, they play a great style. We'll save that for later, though. Exactly. So that's that. Law, that's a depressing week. Yeah. Especially since we since we just lost two in a row. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we're going through a rough patch right now. I think uh, having DeMar out really ruined the rhythm for a lot, and uh, we got to pick it back up. These last two losses were not, not good-looking ones either. Too many shots for Lou Will. That's Too many shots for Lou Will, and just... It just looked ugly, man. Just soft rebounding, lots of turnovers. Uh, the body language was poor. The togetherness was poor. It's it true. was poor. It's true. And DeMar DeRozan, he, he, you know what? As much as we love him, he's exemplified it. He just got fined $15,000 for his flagrant foul against Brooklyn. There you go. Yeah. Anyways, let's jump to break. All right. Here we go. Break time. We'll be back. Back to Rapscast. This is episode five. We're about to jump into the next segment called the Starting Five. What's up, Jacoby? Tell me about the first one. Well, the first one, something that I've been discussing here, it seems that Masai Ujiri will be active at the deadline. He's looking for another big, specifically somebody to play the four spot. Um, I guess he doesn't like the size of the defense, or maybe he's disappointed with Patrick Patterson. I'm not exactly sure why. Kyle, you, you kick this off first. Why is he doing it, and how's it going to work out for the Raps? Well, I definitely don't think he's disappointed with Patrick Patterson. I would say he's probably the brightest spot we have. He's doing everything we could ask of him very well. Defense, threes, uh, tr- uh, help defense, rebounding. I- I'm so happy with him. Probably what this comes down to is, is Tyler Hansbrough's playing too much minutes. He's not that talented. He brings hustle, but, I mean, I'm not that high on the guy. And Amir Johnson, as great as he is, we know he's playing at about 60 to 70% just because the guy is really injured, he's really beat up, and he's too tough to take a game off. Mm -hmm. So bring in some help. I mean, Greg Steamsma is not the solution, right? (laughs) The steamer. 
Yeah. So names that have been linked to us, and we've talked about them before, are David West, Taj Gibson, Kenneth Fareed. So rather than talk about who we want, let's talk about how we're going to get them, because we've already talked about who we want of those three. So as we've mentioned before, we have some expiring contracts. We have Char- uh, Chuck Hayes. I almost called him Charles. Chuck Hayes, Tyler Hansbro, Lou Williams. Anyone else? Oh, Tyler Hansbro. We have that. Yeah. Chuck Hayes, Tyler Hansbro, and Lou Williams are all expiring. Oh, and Amir Johnson. Um, how much left on Landry Fields' contract? Oh, and Landry Fields, about $7 million. But about half of it is gone right now. No, so but I, have, mean, I mean the ter- term. Oh, it's, it's done this year. So okay. he's also, we have a lot of expiring contracts. And we even have, we have all our first round picks. And even giving up this year's first round pick is a pretty good option because it's going to, we know it's, it's a weak be, draft. It's a great draft, but we know we're going to have a late pick and we want to go far in the postseason. So right, right. it's a good time to get rid of this pick. So, so the, the Raptors are buyers, essentially. Yeah, if we want to be buyers, I guess this is the question it boils down to. We can't get one of those players for just offering Landry Fields and Chuck Hayes, right? That's too much of a steal. And everybody knows if Masai Ujiri calls you, you probably want to hang up because you're about to get because <laughs> you're about to get killed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the question is, would you want to trade? I would you include either Amir, Tyler Hansbro, or Lou Williams in that trade? Because these are all people that take significant minutes in our rotation. Getting rid of them really changes how we play the game. Um. I'll make this point. Amir, in the next few years, is going to start to get a lot worse than he is right now. Like, he's t- yeah. really towards the end of his of his prime. Like, it's 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 happening, like, as we speak, I think. Like, he's not going to be the same player that he was, like, that Raptor fans have grown to know and love. Of course, I hope he could retire as a Raptor because he's just such a, like, a fan favorite. But uh, I, I wouldn't hate trading Amir to get another power forward, to be honest with you. But... A man that I kind of don't like having in town anymore. I know I've flipped like 180 degrees on this, but Lou Williams has not shown me what I need to see. Um, frankly, I think he's not good for the team atmosphere. I don't like his body language. I don't like how he expects to be like to make highlights every night instead of just win a game. You know, he just wants to hit a cool shot sometimes, or at least it seems that way. Um, I don't like his body language. I don't like the effect he has on the other guards on the team. Um, and this whole the whole street ball mentality, I think, is heaviest with Lou than it is anybody else on this squad so i'd love i yeah you know what i would love to see lou williams go and to see taj gibson come in return whether we send lou and a pick whatever we need to give them um i think that's a trade worth doing and uh masai should uh, should look into getting that done. not just lou i mean like would you include lou like lou a pick and like landry fields or chuck hayes or yeah something, you know Whatever, Maybe whatever. not Chuck Hayes because Chuck Hayes still has actually value. has a practical use to the Raptors. Yeah. But Landry Fields, I mean, just would you include him? So you would include Lou Williams? Well, should I mean, I mean look if they whatever they're willing to accept. If they say Lou will and a pick, and we'll give him to you, that's sweet. Okay. Um, I, I'd too. keep Amir that's before I'd keep Lou Will. That's yeah, I agree. As you said, with Amir, the problem is he needs some time off. He's playing at sixty, and you're probably right. His best days are behind him, and he's a great player. He's so underrated, and he's one of everybody's favorite ra- like Raptors. Everybody who's a Raptor fan loves him. Not only is he a great player, he's a great person. He does a lot of charity work in Toronto. He flew to Africa to be a part of the Giants of Africa Foundation. Great person. Good person you want on your organization to bring other people there. The only thing is from the basketball standpoint, you just wonder how much longer he has with his with his legs. Mm-hmm. He has a lot of miles on them. Exactly. Yeah. And it's a shame because he's, he's great. If he was perfectly healthy, he'd probably be better than, like, Tash Gibson or Kenneth Fareed, something like that. Interesting. I mean, it's a little different because, let's say, like, Kenneth Fareed is used more, right? He's a bigger yes. part of the team. Yeah. But, you know, in talent-wise, he's really goes unnoticed. There is one thing that he's fantastic at. He's very good at scoring out of the pick-and-roll. Like being Amir, this, Amir is one of setting, the best. Yeah, that's yeah. what I mean. He's one of the best pick-and-roll players in the league. Yes. Yeah. Setting pick-and-rolls, And then catching it and finishing. Underrated even post player. He's got a few moves in the post. And a good post passer, not amazing, but good. To me, he's a catch and finish big man. Yeah, but he even has some post moves. I'm, I'm always surprised whenever I think he doesn't, and he hits a three every once and in a while. And he's a good passer too. Yeah, and he does. He, he I love when Amir shoots threes. I, yeah. I, I they actually go in. Like it I haven't might seen be a the miss slowest many. wind up I've ever seen. <laughs> he really takes, takes his time. Takes like an hour, and he jumps like up. an inch and a half off the ground. Yeah, but they go in. So. I digress. I would get rid of Tyler Hansbro, no problem. The only thing I'm worried, you know, on paper, yes, I get rid of Lou Williams for these people. But you have to remember that getting rid of these people, like 
getting rid of Tyler Hansbro, this is a guy we use for 17 to 20 minutes a night. That is a huge part of Dwayne Casey's attack plan. Yeah. So that's that's a lot to change. And that's why, you know, if I was an NBA 2K, that's what I would do. Mm -hmm. But this isn't a video game. And Lou Williams, like it or not, is a huge part of our offense from the bench. So that takes a lot to get around. What happens when he leaves? Just because we don't like Lou Williams, does that mean you're giving all those shots to Terrence Ross? I'm, you're all putting all your eggs in the Terrence Ross basket, essentially. Yeah. So that's that's another scary thing, to just make a huge change like that. Yeah. Because none of those players we've talked about are 20-point, you know, they're not Lou Williams' offense. I mean, most of them are quite good on offense, but... Not not like Lou Williams. I mean, but frankly, the thing about Lou Williams is it's either a game where he puts up like 20-some-odd or it's a game where he misses his first three shots, acts like a malcontent, throwing his arms up, complaining to the ref, you know, all that kind of uh, BS body language. And it's either like he's he's either way up high or he's way up low. But I, I, I don't want to... Uh... I don't want to spoil something from later on. In fact, you know, that's a perfect segue into the second... Uh... Mr. Inconsistent. Yeah, Mr. Inconsistent, Thank Lou you. Williams. Um, look, when Lou Williams came to town, I was, like, beside myself in, with happiness. He's not the type of player that the Raptors are used to signing. They don't sign players that are known around the league for being, like, skilled guys. They may pick up a guy who's, like, uh, you know, they picked up, like, Hito Turkoglu, for instance, like, a couple years back. But Lou Williams, somebody who's, like, really in the prime of his career and scoring the basketball... Not somebody we're used to seeing in Toronto. So when they signed him, I thought that was great. But I got to say, I mean, the guy is not a team-first guy. Abs like, he's just not. And even in like in Toronto, I don't think it's rubbed off on him as much as we thought it would. Maybe being around that kind of culture would make him think, okay, I really am like part of something bigger than just myself. But um, he, he makes it look like it's all about him. Uh, you know, he misses shots, and he's you know he, he doesn't want to like take a lot of uh, responsibility and stuff. Just this whole... His whole swag, Kyle, it's off for me. I don't like what Lou Will is bringing to the Raptors. Even though he hits, even if like the numbers are there, I just don't think he's the Raptors are better with him. I sort of agree, but I, you know what? I think we're placing too much blame on him. And what it falls down to, it's a bit of Casey, right? Dwayne Casey's role for him, Dwayne Casey is very big on stay in your role, and Dwayne Casey's role for Lou Williams is take a lot of shots. It's, so uh... it, it's partly like Lou Williams, I agree with you. But we can't put all the blame on him. Lou Williams is told by his head coach, I want you to shoot a lot. And he is told by his coach at the end of pretty much every quarter, I'm going to not draw up a play for you and you just do whatever the hell you want. Draw, do an ISO and take a shitty three-pointer. That's not on him. That is what he's told to do by his head coach. Mm -hmm. That being said, I sort of agree with you. You know, He has won some games for us, but is he a guy... Do you, you win championships wonder, with Lou Williams? You make deep you gotta, playoff you gotta, runs you gotta, with you Lou gotta Williams? You've got to wonder, is he... Is he yeah, it's trick-or-treat with him. He's either going to be the guy in the playoffs that everybody's going to say he is the X factor, or he's going to be the J.R. Smith. Right, yeah. Right? Yeah. So you wonder, and yeah, you know what? In long-term picture, I, 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 you know what? He's not a must-have. And, you know, if you think back to that trade with him, first of all, we all thought it was a great trade, but now it look at still, the Atlanta Hawks. Look, oh. First of all, look at the Atlanta Hawks. They're doing better without him. So that's right. beside the point. The point is that... We got Lou Williams for next to nothing. We got we got rid of John Salmons, an ending contract, who was garbage, and a second-round pick from this year's draft coming up for Lou Williams and the 16th pick overall last year. And most importantly, a friend for our, our good friend Bruno, okay, <laughs> a fellow Brazilian. Yeah. The insider's thought is that a lot of people thought at the time that this trade was more about getting, Brun uh, getting Bebe and then using Lou as, a, as trade bait. He's great mid contract level, you know, he has he ha he is a good scorer. <laughs> so he he is a good asset to get rid of if we wanted to. It's I just, just think that the hate against him, you know, part of it is on him, right? He does take a lot of shots, he doesn't look to create. He should look to create a little more. I mean, Dwayne Casey says I want offense, that doesn't only mean you shoot, it means find the offense, make the offense for yourself and if you don't have the shot, draw the people in and pass it, mm -hmm. which he hasn't done. But Part of it is on Casey. I mean, he, Dwayne Casey wants him to shoot. Dwayne Casey isn't drawing up plays very well on the offensive end for him. So I can't blame him completely. Because Dwayne Casey depends on the fact that the best defenders on the other side will be preoccupied with Kyle and DeMar. Yeah. And then the third best guy is covering Lou, usually. You dish it off to Lou. Yep. And what I think it should be more of on, in those like last-second scenarios is you actually analyze each individual matchup. And whoever murks their defender, theoretically, by... Like, whoever's clearly mismatched 
you know, throw the ball over there. I think they should actually make a play like, <laughs> rather than just give it to the best guy and let him do an ISO. Maybe run a play, get a guy open. Yeah, but if it breaks down, you're you're screwed. The thing about an ISO is like there's like there's less components. Like, I know, but it seems not to be working. Yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about thing three. Terrence Ross. Yeah, we've been hating on him. Boy, did he plunge himself from the crap. I think he listened to us. I say that every time. I think they listen to us. Yeah, they might. Yeah, they might. Yeah. So Terrence Ross, he listened to me. He went to the NBA 2K gym, worked on his shots. Good for him because he's having a hell of a week. Yeah. Really impressed us uh, during a few games. Had about a 20-point 20, 20 game, a few assists. Really impressive. Yeah, he was the, the lone bright spot in our, in our yeah. last loss to Brooklyn. He like was the only thing that looked like, you know, better than crap. He was really playing well. A lot of those, like, off the crossover jump shots, um, really hitting threes, lots of deep ones. He's, he's a really special jump shooter. Yeah, and I think the office, the front office really thinks that, let's say, he could be – you know, like, let's say the offense that Lou Will brings, but really more complete, better, higher potential. The front office is really high on him. They don't want to trade him. And he could be. He's showing flashes of that. That game, he played really aggressively. I, I don't think we've ever seen a Terrence Ross like that. Really driving, really making his defender look foolish on yeah. a lot of occasions. He ice, he played iso ball quite a bit. And he played iso ball. balls. He drove hard. Played hard, had some good defensive plays. He leaked out for like a great alley oop at one yeah, point. Yeah, 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 and it got the crowd into it. Yeah. yeah, he played fantastic. And if we see that Terrence Ross more consistently, goodbye, Lou Williams. We don't need you. Exactly. It, uh, which would make that whole getting yep. Lou Williams as trade bait, yep. uh, you know, bring that much more validation yeah. to that. And Lou Williams is like his stock is high. You know, you'll get a good return on Lou Williams because yeah. like, the, you know, the fact is this. He's a fantastic NBA scorer, and those guys player. don't stay unemployed very long. Yes. So, so Ter- Terrence Ross, do you think, you think maybe this is a result of getting benched? He kind of has a bit of a chip on his shoulder. I, I want to say yes. I want to like make that story real and that he has a chip on his shoulder. But I think he g- tries his best every game. You know, he's just yeah. a young guy trying to make trying to find himself. Like um, what what happened that made him play? That's making him play better consistently. It I I you know it could be. I don't think it's. When I say chip on his shoulder, I don't think in a selfish way, right? Like, he wants mm-hmm. to be a starter. Fuck Grievous. He just felt, right? like, he just badly thinks, about his performance. Yeah, like, he wants to do the best he can do and, he, you know, and, and be a starter. He was a starter and earned his spot. And I think friendly ha- competition's good and healthy. Yeah. I, I think it helped get his mind right a little bit. But uh, I think he was just working hard, man. I think he's just, in, you know, he's just... Yeah, he's working hard. You know, like, Must it, be. It's, it's very hard to be consistent. It's, it's really yeah. difficult. Every NBA player struggles with it constantly. Yes. And he's a young one. Yes. So it's even harder for we him. We often forget he's only in his third year. Exactly. He's and not he's, playing like He's it. like 20... 23 or something. Yeah, exactly. He's, a young, he's like our age, essentially. Essentially. Or a little older. Yeah, and um, he's playing great. And, you know, it could be a part of the good thing of getting sent to the bench is often the quality of the guy defending you is a little bit worse. Yeah, you know? yeah. You know, T. Ross is a pretty athletic guy, and he's, on most nights, more athletic than the guy guarding him. And every night he's more athletic than the guy off the bench that's guarding him. He's, I'd say, he's like a, about as athletic as you get at the two guard position in the NBA. Uh, yeah, the guy won a dunk contest, and his team won the dunk contest after. His team won his the dunk team. contest. That, that was, was a it. stupid format. Yeah, but that's <laughs> a topic for another time. Yeah, exactly. So good, good job, T. Ross. Yeah, well done, T. Ross. Way to plunge yourself out from the the, the dark depths of Dwayne Casey's. I don't know. It's where do you put? What place do you put people that you don't like? Oh, it's like Dwayne Casey's whipping boy. Whipping boy. Yeah, you never. Once you're a whipping boy, you for Dwayne Casey, you never get out of it. Well, T. T Ross has, has proved that to be not necessarily wrong, but he's we shown you s- that you can you can get his you can <laughs> get back onto the good side of yeah. Dwayne Casey. We might see him become a starter. Grievous Vasquez's minutes are going down. Who knows? Let's talk about Tom Sterner, your favorite assistant coach. Yeah, I think he's got a serious coke problem. I mean, every time every time I see him get interviewed, the guy is in your face like this. And he says, we got to get those turnovers taken care of. They're beating us back down the floor every time. We got to get that ball and play run and gun with them. You know, like stuff like that. Yeah. He's always a super high energy. He looks like he just got off a crazy coke binge every time he's talking to you. Um I wonder how the player is like. I wonder if he's like that in practice, if he's like that with his family. Like, does he turn himself off or is he just built for TV? I really don't get I, it. I think he's just a really animated guy. You know, yeah. we saw at the beginning of the season that the Raptors were always more energized that after uh, after halftime. 
What, what's he putting in their Gatorade? Maybe he's the speech giver. Maybe Dwayne Casey's more of the like. No, uh, Dwayne Casey's too cool to not do the to not give this. Oh, okay. He's too cool for that. <laughs> yeah, but I, you know, watch out. Tom Sterner might be spiking your Gatorade, poking up the Gatorade. Yeah, because I know he, he looks like Coca-Cola. he's on something. I don't know, like maybe like a just a, a six and a half Red Bulls. I don't really know what it is, but he's yeah, like, but 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 for real, he's he's the best. He's a great assistant coach. Yes. He's a great interview. I love hearing him every uh, halftime. He probably really gets to the players. He's very good at uh, at working with players. He works a lot with Bruno and Bebe. He knows what makes people. He he knows what people uh, you know get motivated by or just yeah. like get interested in. Good coach. Yeah. Hope he stays with us. Yeah, me too. I think the Raptors have an above average coaching staff. So yes. Good on you, Todd Sterner. So let's talk about Brooklyn times two. Yeah. Our... So I was actually at Brooklyn. Yeah. To see the Brooklyn game. Yeah, yeah. Tell fantastic. us about the game. Tell us about the experience. It was fantastic. Man. There were a lot of Raptors fans. I was really surprised about that. Probably like 40% Raptors fan. I couldn't believe it. I walked up. I asked the guy, can I buy a Raptors jersey? The guy looked at me like, Get you the are in fuck the, out Yeah, here. he looked at me. He's like, you are in the wrong fucking place. <laughs> he did not like that. He's like, you could go in and get some Nets stuff. And I'm like, yeah, man. Like, I hate the Nets. <laughs> I'm not, I, I told him that. I said, I hate the Nets. I would rather burn that jersey than wear it. So no thanks. What's He's a, like fifty percent off. No, what's the you. passion like in Brooklyn for the team? Have they? Uh, d- does it really look like they deserve the team that they got? Like, do they really um, support them, or is it just sort of like a, a trendy? I think it's a little bit of a trend. I mean, like for the first half of the game, not very loud. The, the arena wasn't full. Granted, the last, they're losing like, this year. Yeah, I mean, the last like five minutes of that game were really loud for Brooklyn. They, I guess, they do have some good fans, but definitely not as good as Toronto. Mm-hmm. And that was a great game. I mean. Talking from Brooklyn's perspective, they had two players, Jarrett Jack and Brooke Lopez, combined for 70 points. The game went to overtime. We won. We had DeMar with a near triple-double. He had like 27 points, nine assists, and seven rebounds. Unbelievable. Mm. It was a hell of a game to watch. Yeah, I was just going to say, you got a good bang for your buck, Kyle. Yeah, it was a fun one. All right, so that, so the Raptors took that one, but then uh, just again this week they met, and boy was their fate uh, changed Quite a bit. Uh, not the same result that they had and not the result they were looking for at all. The Nets kind of embarrassing the Raptors, frankly. is a very, very frustrating game to watch. Um, and I think they ended up losing by like close to 20 points. We did get to see Bruno get a few minutes in the NBA. So. Yeah, that's generally not a good thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Unless you're, the, unless you're on the other side of that uh, pickle. Yeah. Uh, you know, the trend of those two games that we should talk about is that Jarrett Jack, both games, lit it up. And that comes down to Kyle Lowry. Like, you know, I, we've mentioned that Kyle Lowry often struggles against really quick, elitely quick guards like Jeff Teague. But Jared Jack, Jack is not one of them. He's not one of them. So, Kyle, what's what's up with Kyle Lowry? He's not letting, he's not, you know, bringing it on the defensive side. Yeah. Mostly he's just complaining to the ref. Yeah, I've, I've been seeing a lot of that from the Raptors. Yeah, a lot, a lot of, of complaining. Whining. And they, when you live and die by how much you get to the foul... The foul line, rather, like yeah, that. You're only that, as good as, uh, as how the nice ref. the ref is. Exactly, and that slumps. Like that will, like some nights, the ref will be different than other ones. Like yeah. you got to focus on what you can control. He's not focusing on D. And yeah, Jarrett Jack lit it up. Yeah. Former Raptor. Yeah. Same thing with uh, Alan Anderson last and game. And DJ Augustine before yep. Raptor. Maybe it's just that these guys have chips on their shoulders and they're trying to show their team. There might, they might be a little. Uh, they might have some animosity that they're not playing on this like cool, trendy, new, upward moving team. It might know? be. Yeah. So I I couldn't believe Jared Jack. I thought okay once he got by, but two games in in within two, like within one week span, unbelievable. The guy gets thirty five points and then like twenty five points, mm-hmm. which Un- is like way above his average. Way above his average. He averages like fourteen points. He now starts over Darren Williams. Yeah, well he deserves it. Darren Williams is a little bitch. Whatever happened to that guy? Went uh, anyway. Another time. Yeah, but he's not elitely quick, so it's really just what's going on with Lowry. Lowry has to find himself because not only are we seeing him complain and not have great body language and not play defense like we expect, but we also are starting to see that he's really forcing his game. I mean, in that first Brooklyn game, he had about 10 points, but really coming off like maybe 4 for 14 shooting, something ridiculous. He's really, he stopped trying to let the game come to him and he's taking, in that game, he took the hardest shots of everybody. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. just tried to force it that first quarter. Take shoot, 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 yeah. shoot, shoot. He finished the first quarter one for five. I hope it's not um, going from being an unappreciated point guard to all of a sudden being an all-star starter that has gotten to his head. I hope not. 
Because that could maybe be, he could expect that now that, that I'm this, I, I need to do more. But yeah, exactly, like now, oh, I'm a star, I'm an all star starter. You know, I'm gonna take these hard yeah. shots and hit them. I the, think his best a- aspect was really letting the game dictate. It was just not, doing, not doing saying, what was needed. I need to put up 20 shots, saying I'll put up as many shots as read they and give react. Me. Yeah, and if not, I'll defer, or and if not, I'll rebound, and if not, I'll play defense, or maybe and I'll play defense, but. Yeah. But it's, it really went wrong against Brooklyn. Yeah, I, I think, you know, he's also coming off, a, a, like, an injury he's playing through, but he could use a break for a game. Like, take an easy game. Next time they play the Knicks, the Magic, the Bu- uh, not the Bucks, the Knicks, the, Knicks, the Mag- Magic, the Lakers, take a game off. Minnesota. <laughs> any, uh, yeah, any Minnesota, of those. any of those. Take a game off, r- rest, relax. You need it. DeMar got his time off. Different reason, but yeah. So that's the end of starting five. Let's take another break. All right, off to break we go. We'll see you in a few. Welcome back from break. It's time for King of the North. Yeah. The King of the North. Kyle, who's our King of the North? King of the North this week, DeMar DeRozan. Tell me why. He had a hell of a week. Not only was he shooting well, but he really brought some different aspects to his game. We saw a lot of passing, a lot of rebounding. He was pretty much a triple-double threat most games of the night. He had one stinker, actually two stinkers against the Bucks and the Nets the second time, but we really saw him trying to become a complete basketball player and you know DeMar DeRozan is the type of guy where every season he gets a little better and we were kind of questioning like what's there else for him to do like maybe this is this is who he is a great scorer and that's it but he you could really see he's trying to become a complete basketball player now he knows he's a good scorer now he wants to be a complete player get an assist and when he's when he's a passer when he defers his shot then you know the Raptors are playing well because every time the ball touches DeMar's hands, you know he's a threat to score. Mm-hmm. And if that's the only thing he is, then you just guard him to score. If he gets the ball and you're a defender, you run to him because you know he's going to do something. If he defers, then that guy he's deferring to is going to have a great clean shot. And it really it just it makes the team so much better. I was so impressed with this week. Uh, we've had this debate, but in my opinion, DeMar DeRozan is the best player on the Toronto Raptors. Disagree. We've we've talked yeah, about know. that before, but uh, yeah, no, I'd have to agree. King of the North, man. Um, just coming back from injury, which can be tough. You just have to get back into it. You imagine playing like almost every other night against the top uh, competition, and then you take like a week, like multiple week break. Uh, you know, getting baptized by fire is not an easy way to go. But uh, he made it look easy. So yeah, Demar Derozan, King of the North. Way to play, man. You know, a game manager. He's doing what Kyle used to, what we just talked about, what Kyle wasn't doing well. Yeah. Uh, he's he's doing it well. You know, he, he understands the context of the game well. Yeah, efficient shots, setting up teammates, really doing what's needed, becoming a really, really potent offensive threat. Like James like James Harden type style, where you know he could score at will, but he could also get a, an assist at will. If he brings that he often... He can hurt you so many ways. If he brings that type of game often, then that guy is... A, a yearly all-star. Yeah. Easy. Yeah. Easy. Okay? Congrats to DeMar. Yeah, let's see more of it before we really congratulate him. Two games, three games or so, you did it. I want to see more of that because that was the most complete games I've ever seen him play. So that's King of the North. All right. And uh, with the end of King of the North, that signifies that we're coming up to the end of episode five here, Kyle. Why don't you uh, tell the people how they can listen to us and where they can find us? We're everywhere, motherfuckers. You can follow us on YouTube. You're listening to us right now. Just subscribe. We're on Tumblr. We're on Facebook. You can email us. We really would like if you email us with if, with any questions you might have or stuff you want to hear in the future. Comments. You know, this is really to start a discussion. If you disagree with us, if you agree with us, if you want to elaborate, go ahead. You know, we, we want to jump on it and uh, jump in on it. Yeah. You don't even have it. to formally send an email. A YouTube comment is okay. Yeah, for that's, Kyle what, and that's I. what I mean. Yeah, we'll read it. You have any suggestions? Want to talk about it? Cool. Hit us up. Even you know, send us as we always say, send us your hate mail too. If it's funny enough, we'll read it. I'm down. And with that, we gotta say goodbye. Have a good week, Raps fans, and we'll see you next Friday. We the North. Stay cool. <laughs>